James Moore and Adrian Desmond wrote a book called Darwin, which I thought, which, which, uh, I, I enjoyed reading it so much, I thought it was one of the best books I ever read. Uh, Brian knew James Moore, um, and he obviously knew Adrian Desmond as well. And uh, James Moore and Adrian Desmond's book on Darwin is brilliant, because it's reading that book that gave me a clue as to how to understand what Darwin was actually doing. Um, again, it's one of those things where, as I said the other day, D Darwin was really invented in 1959. And the, the stories that are told about Darwin now, and the people who are anti-Darwin, or imagine they're anti-Darwin, tell about Darwin, uh, and it's not what he was doing at all. And um, the problem with the people who are anti-Darwin, as always, is they don't actually know anything about Darwin. Same with the people who are anti the mechanical philosophy and attribute it to Newton, don't realise uh, what fools they're making of themselves because Newton was not a mechanical philosopher. Um, so, but this, there's nothing you can do about this sort of thing. Uh, it just go on forever. So let us get on with something now, which I think is uh, b brings us in to the greater depth of the thing. I'm taking this thing to try and calm us down. I want to look now at this one organ, this dynamic unity of coming into being, and see what that tells us about the nature of this one organ. And this brings us to what I call the self-differencing organ. And it's not long, but I'm going to read this bit because I tried to get it as clear as I could. And you just have to follow it. If one and the same organ presents itself to us in different forms, then each organ is that organ, but differently, and not another organ. Proteus is always one and the same Proteus, but differently, and not another Proteus. There are two Proteuses. It is always the very same one, and not another one, and yet it is always becoming different from itself. It becomes other without becoming another. It becomes the other of itself and not another one. Goethe's one and the same organ, manifesting as different forms, is a self-differencing organ producing differences of itself. self-differencing organ producing differences of itself. What else would a self-differencing organ do? So the different organs we see are the self-differences of one organ. This is the key thing. It's a self-differencing organ producing differences of itself. And what we see is different organs. But those different organs are actually self-differences of one organ. And again, you can think of this as being like the reversing cube. But you can always see it both ways. We can see different organs. That's what we can see. It's the, the cube in the default mode. We can all easily see. Then there's the other way of seeing, in which instead of seeing different organs, we see 
self differences of one organ. There is different difference, but they're not different organs. Because we haven't come into separation. We've gone upstream and we are pre separation. We are before separation. Yeah. What we discover here is the, to me, extraordinary idea of self-difference instead of self-sameness. It is an extraordinary idea because if we look at the Western philosophical tradition from Plato onwards, it's worked entirely with the notion of self-sameness. The idea that something can become different from itself whilst remaining itself instead of becoming something else. That's the key thing. It becomes different from itself whilst remaining itself and not becoming something else. Otherwise it wouldn't be self-different. When we go upstream into the coming into being, we discover the self-differencing organ, which appears downstream as several different organs. We are before separation, therefore. To borrow a term from Deleuze, a French philosopher, we find, quote, we find there is other without there being several. It's a clear statement of what it's like to be before separation, pre, in a separate uh, condition of pre-separateness, pre-separation. So what we find is that the unity of coming into being is the dynamic unity of self-differencing, in which difference is now intrinsic to unity. The difference is in the unity. Here, the unity is the very dynamics of self-differencing. That's an astonishing thing. The unity is the dynamics of self-differencing. And therefore, difference is there in the unity. Whereas the other mode we've been talking about, and which is the one that's been talked about for two and a half thousand years, is one <coughs> from which difference has been excluded. And if you look at the development of modern physics, the, um, the key thing, the remedial work coming up now, um, people think that physics and so on developed when people started to take notice of what their senses told them. But as I mentioned later, it actually developed when people uh, went away from the senses and even denied the senses in favour of what is mathematical. It's the great discoveries of physics are the mathematical laws. Now, if you look at the form which these mathematical laws take once they're discovered, they all take the form of excluding difference. So if we take Kepler's third law, the planetary motion, if you think about, if you look at the different planets, they all move differently in the sky. If you put them into the heliocentric system, they all move differently, they're different distances from the sun, and they take different times to go around the sun, so they're all different. Difference is what you find. If you now take the distance from the sun, r, and the period to go around, t, and you make the fraction r cubed divided by t squared, <coughs> <coughs> you find astonishingly <coughs> that comes out to be the same for all the planets and it would be the same for any body going around the sun and um, in, 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 in the book I don't know if I'll keep it in, in, the book, in, a, in a, a footnote I've actually done it there we did it, Brian did it here one year because there was someone who wouldn't believe it and Brian in the afternoon simply did it for them on the blackboard. And he, he was shocked at how much it comes out um, to, be, to be so much the same. So, if, if, you know, if we were around at that time, this discovery would seem to have been absolutely amazing. We, we've discovered here a unity where what we actually see everywhere is differences. And um, 
we would actually probably call this holistic because it pertains to the whole system of the sun and the planets um, people don't like me saying that but we get very upset but if you could put yourself back into the mindset of that time you wouldn't have the word holistic but you certainly get the sense you discovered something about the sun and the planets as a whole and this is the kind of thing boy did it turn people on this was the new thing if we had been around at that time this is what we'd have been doing today and we would have been going on fantastic and we've been going on saying we've discovered the thoughts of God and so on because that's what it easily feels like but if you look at the form of that law because it is wonderful it, it is absolutely wonderful to discover that and then it goes on throughout the whole of physics it's got these kind of laws that comes out and they all have the same quality but what you look at the final consequences you've discovered something from which all differences are excluded something which is the very same for all and this I believe is the real root of the identification of on unity as that which is the very same rather than the more empirical one I described already today which also is there more common sense one but if you actually study things in terms of the cultural historical context you'll see that this had an enormous impact in Europe this kind of discovery and the reason is partly also political um, because uh, people began to look at this and say what a pity that we can't do the same kind of thing in other areas of life for example this came arose out of the circumstances of the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, which was a devastating war. I mean, I have read that there are people in Germany who have still got some kind of folk memory of it, because in the Germanic lands, it wasn't Germany, one in three people were murdered. That's a huge number of people. One in three were murdered in that war, because the superpowers of the time the superpowers being Austria and Sweden. Sweden? Yes, Sweden was the superpower. It, it takes somebody. Sweden was the Protestant superpower. Amazing, isn't it? And Austria, of course, was the Catholic superpower. And they fought their battles in between in, in Germany. And so, or the Germanic lands. And so, after all this was over, which all came through religious dissent, people started to say, if only we could actually, in our ordinary lives, think like we do in science. Uh, where, for example, and they took mathematics as the model. Because you can say, for example, Protestant triangles are no different from Catholic triangles. So if you're doing triangles, Protestant, Catholic, doesn't matter. And they worked up from there. And they said, you know, Newton's law of gravity is true for everyone. Now, can we find lo laws of human society, moral laws and so on, like that, which will be true for everybody? Therefore, there can't be any disagreement, and therefore we can't kill each other. And this was the ideal of universal reason, universalism, which developed in Europe in the 18th century, uh, which gave one form to what's called the Enlightenment particularly, this is particularly the French Enlightenment, it's the French that went big on this because they were big on the mathematics there are other forms of the Enlightenment too. the Enlightenment in, in Britain in England has got took different forms, never mind about that and of course after that people dissented from this and the Germans dissented and they said we don't want to be all the same we want difference and they began to say what really matters is difference and the uniqueness of the particular. It was a reaction to this. But if you know the historical circumstances, you can see why this idea of finding something from which all differences was excluded was terribly, terribly attractive. And uh, the model for this was the development of the new mathematical physics. Uh, and of course, the other model, of course, was the terrific availability of Euclid's ele book Elements because that had been translated into all languages, and so that was another big model. So, although to us today we now see the limitation of this, at that time it looked like something absolutely an extraordinary opportunity. And I always like to talk about this because it's so easy not to enter into the 
you've got to enter into the feeling of this kind of thing, enter into what it does. So if you just simply say, well, here's a kind of unity from which all differences have been excluded, we don't want anything like that, do we? Well, no, we don't. But there was a very good reason how this happened. So um, the significance of Goethe, and I've not mentioned that, this clever, this, this, Goethe does what neither of them could do. There was this reaction in Germany against this, and that didn't work either because um, that fell into something else. Goethe strikes the balance. I think I actually said at the very beginning, because I wrote this rather carefully, uh, he finds uh, the idea of the one and the many in which unity does not dominate diversity, and yet at the same time diversity does not overpower unity. So I could have actually put there the first part's the French, the second part was the Germans. Um, but that's it. And Goethe managed to do something which held those two in balance. And that's the very thing we're working on now. Because this new idea, this dynamic idea of the one and the many, resolves that problem. <coughs> and uh, I think when you see it, it's pretty terrific. So I'll now go back to this idea of self difference in which uh, that's I, don't know, I can't remember how I got into what I just said there but I did I'm sure it must have been uh, yeah yeah uh, that's the difference with the laws of nature that's right they, they exclude all difference now we have a, oh that's that statement that's what turned me on <coughs> um, here the unity is the very dynamics of self-differencing. <coughs> That's extraordinary. Now, so we've now got the unity of coming into being is the dynamic unity of self-differencing. The unity of the finished products is the static unity of self-sameness. And now, in order to understand this uh, and to learn how to think about this, because we're always in danger <coughs> of uh, we're always in danger here of actually thinking that we're thinking about it and we've actually slipped sideways um, when you really get this you've got to really get yourself into the feeling of what self-differencing means. And you've got to see the form of this. <coughs> and it's quite extraordinary. <coughs> because you, <coughs> you enter into a condition which is paradoxical in the sense that it is one and many at the very same time. Now first, usually, something is either one or it's many. In this, what we're dealing with here, we come into a condition which something is one and many at the very same time because the many are the one, the one is the many. But you, you've got to help yourself to not just treat this... <coughs> I don't got a gun. You put me out of my misery. Um, you've not got to just treat this abstractly. So I want to now talk about the difference between an intensive an extensive an extensive distinction and an intensive distinction I want to introduce this fundamental difference between extensive and intensive which actually is unusual for people but it goes back to medieval philosophy which is where I first encountered it well, no, it's not quite a, uh, and it, it occurs in mathematics. But in fact, uh, the, the original notion comes from medieval philosophy, but you don't need to know that. Uh, when we talked about the act of distinction, and there are many reasons why in this work I start with the act of distinction, because here I'm dealing with distinction again. We said that the, uh, uh, the act of distinction is a unitary act of differencing slash relating in brackets. Do you remember that? Yeah. That's the act of distinction. We, we deal with that. Well, if the distinction is intensive, it takes the same form 
only now it's a unitary act of self-differencing slash self-relating. All you have to do is stick self in there, and that will give you the kind of distinction that we're dealing with here. Now I need to bring that out. <coughs> when one thing is different from another thing, the distinction is extensive. When something is different from itself, and of course the whole point about being different from itself is it remains the same as itself, so if it's different from itself, it's, it's still the same as itself, but differently. That is an intensive distinction. And to help you think about it, we can take some simple models. And the one which I found very useful is the hologram. God, have I got another hour and a quarter to go? The hologram. I'm um, going back now to how holograms used to be uh, when they first came out. They were called transmission holograms and they were on glass plates. And you didn't see anything on the plate, just squirrely lines. They used to have exhibitions of these things and it was pretty good stuff. And uh, you, um, it was made with the light of a laser and then laser light had to be shone through it the right kind and then a picture would appear, which was called an optical reconstruction. It was more than an image, because it looked as if you had taken the appearance of something off and put it on the screen. So, for example, if it was an object, you felt it was three-dimensional. In fact, you felt you could walk around it. And if you started to move, you'd find yourself walking around it. And so it was an amazing thing. <clears throat> so realistic, I remember one, a giant one, and it was of a horse galloping, full pelt, towards me. And I jumped back, because it was so real. There were wonderful things. Now, this doesn't work for today's holograms, because they're produced in a different way. So don't try what I'm going to say. Otherwise you'll be cross with me. But I won't be here, so it won't matter. Um, the, um, let's take this big hologram of a horse galloping towards me. Supposing I've got this, and supposing that uh, Josie says, it is Josie, isn't it? Yes. I couldn't spell that. Uh, you point to someone their name, you get the wrong name, it's the most embarrassing thing there is. That's it, Josie, it is. Uh, says to me, wow, I really like that, where can I get one? I say, no problem Josie, here, you can have this. And I get a cutter and I break it in half. This upsets her very much. She says, stop, 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 you're ruining it. But the whole point is, when I give her half this glass plate, so I've divided this glass plate into two halves, and when I give it to her, and it's illuminated, she says in amazement, but my God, was that Australian enough? Was that, my God, is that how you say it? My God, the horse is still there. The whole horse is still there, jumping out at her. And I've got mine. And I've got the whole horse jumping out at me. So we've divided, but we haven't actually produced two things. Because if we ask the question, well, how many holograms are there? Well, there are two glass plates, that's for sure. But how many actual holograms are there in terms of the image? The answer, so far as I'm concerned, is there's only one. But this one can't be the same as the one that was there before it was divided, can it? And so here we've got a self-distinction in which we produce what I call a multiplicity in unity. And the whole point about the multiplicity in unity is it does not fragment the unity because each is the very same one. There's not much difference involved here, we'll come to that later. Just get you to see each is the very same one. So you've got one and the other of the one. You don't have one and another one, because then you'd have two. Now, that would be the situation you'd be if you actually wasn't a, a, it wasn't a hologram, but it was a photographic plate in which there was a horse. If I took a photographic plate and broke it in half, then Josie would have half a horse 
and I'd have half a horse. The only way to do this with a photographic plate <coughs> is to make another copy. And then there are two. So if you think about the difference between getting two photographically and getting two holographically, you can see in the photographic case that we're dealing here with an extensive distinction because there's one photo and now here's another photo and that's a separate photo, it's another photo. But in the hologram case, it isn't. It's the same one. So here you've got one in the form of two. That's astonishing. You've got one and the other of the one and that is an intensive distinction. And I have found this terribly useful over the years because what I used to do was vi visualise this to myself and visualise doing it and seeing what the consequences were in both cases, one the photographic case and the other the holographic case. And if you do that, you see immediately what the difference is and you'll get the sense that the holographic case is like a different dimension of things. It's intensive, whereas the other is extensive. And you can begin to build up this sense of what it means to, for there to be an intensive distinction. And it begins to feel like a different dimension, which is, as it were, orthogonal to the main one. Anyway, <coughs> now there are, many, <coughs> there are many examples of this that we can give. Uh, and uh, one of the ones that I particularly like is the vegetative reproduction of plants. It is said, my wife doesn't believe this, that's why I have to preface it with it is said that <laughs> if, you, if you take uh, the leaf of a fuchsia plant and you break it into pieces and you plant each piece separately, then providing the conditions are right, other, uh, each of those will grow into a fuchsia plant. So if you take, divide a plant into what, six? Ideally, you should end up with six pots with a fuchsia plant in each. And so the question then is, well, how many fuchsia plants are there? And as I think you can see, the answer is there's one. Even when there's six, there's one. The division is intensive because each organically is actually the very same plant. And you can, you can, you can be very generous, you can give them away, People can take them to different parts of the country, it makes no difference. And it's still one plant. And that is where the organic case is the same as the holograph case. Um, here we've got multiplicity and unity. Although you look and you see uh, several plants, uh, organically there's only one plant because each is the very same one and not another one. So the plant is divisible like the hologram and yet remains whole, <coughs> which is actually what indivisibility really means. Indivisibly, people thought things are indivisible if they're so hard you can't cut them up. That's a very crude picture. Indivisibility is when it's dead easy to divide something, but when you divide it, you get the whole back again. That's what it, what it is. So, although there appear to be many plants here, there's actually really one plant and it's one plant which has become multiple instead of many plants. So this is another aspect of this way of putting it. Something can become multiple without becoming many. And then when it falls apart it becomes many. But it's, it's in our seeing it falls apart. So again you could have this reversing cube and you could have many plants and then on the bit that's hard to see, you could have one plant which is multiple. And that multiple is the multiplicity in unity <coughs> in which each is the very same one. <coughs> that is an intensive distinction. But when we look at it, we see many plants. We are seeing it extensively. Really, these are like two dimensions that cross. Uh, imagine a cross um, and the horizontal one is the extensive and the vertical is the intensive. Where they cross you can see either way. Um, this is how you can have division within the whole or within unity without it fragmenting. 
So it, there's multiplicity within unity without it being divided and therefore ceasing to be unity. It's astonishing. <coughs> Extensively, <coughs> we can have either one or many. One only or many ones. Intensively, we can have one and many at the same time because the one is many and the many is one. The, men, the one is the many, the many is the one. It's astonishing. Uh, again, we're in this thing, going back to the article on paradox. If you think about that, what we've actually moved into is a completely paradoxical position. But nobody seems to be terribly troubled by it because, in fact, we found out how to do it. So we have the opposites now. We've moved through the opposites into the realm where the opposites are no longer separate and you have both simultaneously. And that's the intensive distinction. And uh, you get to this by practicing it. I practiced a lot. It was in the article I wrote in the 70s when I did this work, um, when I really got into this. It had an amazing effect on me. I, I, I found my, it's as if my head had been taken off and replaced with another head. It's weird. And I could be walking down the street and this would happen. Or I could be doing the washing up and it could happen. Any, any time and I suddenly started to see in this way then it went back again because I was working on this a lot and so I, you can actually see this you see people say well that's impossible and that's just a thought and so on but no you can actually develop the imagination in which you actually see this or the intuition I prefer to think in terms of intuition there is imagination involved that. <coughs> sometimes it does happen you <coughs> You actually see this directly, but the intuition is there. So there are many examples of vegetative reproduction where what appears to us as many plants is in fact one plant being itself multiply. I'm not saying differently here because they're, they're, they're not differences, but one plant, <coughs> one plant being itself differently will appear to us as many different plants. And there are lots of lovely examples of this. Um, the one that I particularly like is the King Edward potato, um, or any potato for that matter. If you take a particular species of potato, say the King Edward, uh, when they, uh, these potatoes are planted, you, you actually plant them from potatoes. You don't do any fertilization stuff in the flower. So you just plant these things they call seed potatoes. And then more potatoes grow. That means, in fact, that when you do this, all the potatoes of one variety in the world are one plant. Across space and through time. So since the original... What happens is the breeders make new varieties and then you set that variety by using seed potatoes. But that means that the King Edward potato um, means that wherever it has occurred, whether it do, wherever it does occur or has occurred, it is all the same plant. There is only one King Edward potato plant, which is divided and divided and divided and become multiple and multiple and multiple until it's gone into billions and billions and tons of potatoes. It's a pretty big plant. But nobody thinks of it that way. We just go to the supermarket and buy King Edward potatoes, and we just see, oh, several potatoes, many potatoes, and many ones. Um, it's uh, obviously, because we see it in this extensively, <coughs> we see them physically, like physical bodies, there's no more than like a pile of bricks. If we saw them organically, then we would actually see that each of the potatoes we were buying is actually the very same one. You could try that out in, say, the supermarket, couldn't you? You could go up and you could say, well, actually, you're charging me for all these potatoes, but actually each is the same one. So I think, <laughs> try it and see what happens, eh? <laughs> I think they'd be very interested. <laughs> It's <coughs> this idea of an intensive distinction 
which we need to see the transformation of the idea of the one and the many in Goethe's dynamical thinking. But the examples we've given so far illustrate this kind of distinction, but only consider multiplicity and not genuine diversity. <coughs> All I'll say here, because I don't want to go into great detail, is that, um, in this case, hologram division, plant cuttings result in identical holograms or plants. Whereas the one organ Goethe is describing can present itself to us in manifold forms, in different forms, vegetative leaf, petal, stamen, and so on. <coughs> well, <coughs> all I'm doing is suggesting to you that the kind of thinking that is needed for Goethe's way of seeing is, in fact, exactly the same as this. Only now you have to make the extra step of imagining that there is diversity there rather than, than just multiplicity. There are things you can do um, to try to help you on the way, but I think they're very artificial. Um, and uh, the main thing is to actually see it. it. When you see the idea, you can then see what Goethe is talking about in the same manner of this intensive distinction, dynamically. But I mean, if you take the duck rabbit, for example, the duck rabbit is an intensive figure because it's not duck and rabbit. If it was duck and rabbit, you'd have one and another and they'd be separate, but you don't have one and another. The whole figure is duck, the whole figure is rabbit. And therefore the distinction here is an intensive distinction. They're nested in one another intensively. So here we have a multiplicity in unity in which there is difference. So that is the case. Now you could imagine that being extended. You could just imagine you might have a figure in which there were several different things. And then you could imagine that there could be many things or whatever. But that's all in imagination uh, because you can't have that kind of figure. But it's a simple picture. You can also do it with a hologram. Uh, you can get m m multiple holograms. You can take a, a picture of a uh, a horse and actually on the same hologram you can have a picture of a hippopotamus and on the same hologram you can have a picture of a camel and if you illuminate it correctly and you just move your position slightly where the horse was it will disappear and the hippopotamus will appear move again where the hippopotamus was a uh, camel will appear. You've seen this sort of thing in advertising hoardings. Yeah. As you're going along, it changes, the same thing. <laughs> These are very artificial, and uh, there are Gertianists of a certain flavour who find this very, very, very annoying, this kind of um, illustration. Um, and I mean, I've been talking about this for years. God knows how many years. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know. Anyway, long, long decades. And uh, I, I'm in one case being told uh, that I was an agent of the devil. And the reason was because I had brought up the hologram, which clearly was a luciferic device and so on and that, and that I was letting in anti-human forces by doing this. And well, quite a few people believed that. Then they got over that. And they say, well, these kind of things are very, very artificial. And there's a certain person who should not be mentioned who actually, the, the example I've just given, got really annoyed with me. And me I've got a bone to pick with you. And it turned out that it was because I said, you said that a, a horse could turn into a hippopotamus when it can't. I didn't say a horse could turn into a hippopotamus. This is just the, well, it, it's misleading. Oh, God. Um, and basically, they don't like any kind of mechanical analogy or technological analogy. However, their great hero, Goethe, did. Because Goethe used the kaleidoscope for this purpose. It was his new invention. And he said, look, the kaleidoscope, it has to shake it, it has that pattern. 
Now you shake it and the same has another pattern. Now you shake it and the same thing has another pattern. This is it. And but they don't know this, or if they know it, they suppress it. Can I say to them, well, Goethe used the technology of his day. And that was the, uh, the kaleidoscope. My guess is if Goethe was here today, he'd use the hologram. Because he was not as um, bigoted as a lot of people who call themselves Goethe in this art. Now I must say no more. Is your finger going up because you want to yes. say something? Yes, I just wanted to, um, I guess, looking at what Goethe is saying, from, as you were describing it, the, 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 uh, the idea of the Big Bang. Um, so oh, no. Is, what's the no. what's the um, uh, parallel? No, or you're not talking about the cosmological Big Bang. Yes. No, we don't go there. <laughs> no, we don't go there. We don't do that. This is a gigantic intellectual, a, a gigantic intellectual extrapolation. What we do is we stick with the phenomena we're dealing with, um, and if we're going to talk about the Big Bang the first thing we need to do is to get some real information. And that real information would include looking at all the alternative approaches that have been uh, suggested in detail, especially those done by Hoyle and his colleagues over the years, uh, which are actually... I mean, I have a book at home, a very detailed physics book, which is a, a different approach to cosmology, it's called, I think it's called that. And the amount of detail that's been done on approaches which criticise the Big Bang thing. The Big Bang is a term which is invented as a joke. It was invented by Hoyle uh, to say these people, they're so stupid, they think it was like a, a Big Bang. And he meant it like that. And the term is now stuck as being the description of this thing. And um, I mean... If you knew the... Uh, look, see, in science, you must always look at the assumptions which are being made and then look at the assumptions that they're not telling you about. And you must work out all the different possibilities. Goethe believed in doing things in the most comprehensive way possible. So consequently, in his later life, he saw quite clearly that the Newtonian approach to colour was also included as a possibility. This again is something that a lot of the Goetheans don't want you to know. Um, that in fact he, uh, he saw that you could not exclude that. Now, what you must do is look at all the different alternatives. So, one, don't extrapolate from plants to the Big Bang. But if you really must, then go and spend six months going into the details so you actually make sure you know something really about it. Because I can tell you, the stuff about the cosmology, which I'm rusty on now but knew before, which <coughs> you'd be astonished. Uh, 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 well, you should get hold of Hoyle's book, a diff it's Hoyle, Nali Carr, and. Uh, Hoyle, Nali Carr, and. Can't, uh, B squared FH, Burbage. Burbage, it, 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 no, Burbage could be dead. Hoyle. Nanika, Burbage, there's three of them. It's called, uh, oh God, uh, cosmology, a different approach. It's very physics. Uh, you see the kind of way in which quasars can have a different interpretation. Every, all, all these things have different interpretations. So when they make cosmological generalizations on the basis of this to the early universe, you've got to realize that there are fashions in science. And right now the fashion is the Big Bang cosmology combined with particle physics. And it's, uh, there's nothing you can do right now in science that doesn't do it that way. Why? Because it's jobs for the boys. There, there's a whole industry doing this. It means there's jobs in this. You get grants in this. You get money. You don't want someone coming along and saying, no, it's not like this. Um, so really, we don't go, we don't go there. <coughs> now, where do we go though? That's a question. Where do we go? I've done the duck, mentioned the duck rabbit. Okay. Now, picture. I know where we're going to go. We're going to go to a picture. Which is a bit easier before the next bit. Which is a bit harder. Okay. Now, I, 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 I have mentioned, I believe, <coughs> that Goethe's 
phenomenological way of seeing the metamorphosis of the plant. And remember, here by phenomenological, I'm actually referring to <coughs> going upstream, etc., etc., has been confirmed by modern research in electron microscopy and <coughs> develop <coughs> God, de- developmental genetics. <coughs> here it is. Especially for you. <coughs> Can you all see it? Now, this is a photograph of the self-differencing organ. Of course, you wouldn't look at that and say it's a photograph of the self-differencing organ because you've got to learn to see it. You've got to learn to see that meaning. Um, But uh, it's an early embryonic stage of a floral bud. And Brian could tell you pretty much what it was and he did tell me pretty much what it was and I pretty much didn't write it down <laughs> so now I don't know um, but what we've got here is um, these are what I would call <coughs> becoming sepals that's the outer covering these one, two, three Four, five are becoming petals. These one, two, three are becoming stamens. This is what I call, I call them becoming that because this is this is a snapshot of an embryo. And there you have the self-differencing organ, self-differencing. It's a beautiful picture. <coughs> Oh, looking at the coming into being this is Goethe's Goethe talked about this diversely metamorphosed organ and there it is <coughs> and um, as confirmed by uh, modern biology and um, uh, the story behind this picture <coughs> sorry it's getting worse <coughs> the story behind this picture yeah. Would you like to join some of Daisy's cough syrup? I've got some in there, yeah. But I, I've taken a load of it, I'm swimming in it. Yeah. <laughs> I just have one of these while I'm sitting and do this for a minute. I will admit. Um, uh, it won't go away now till I stop talking. That's right. Till I go home. Um, go home. E.T. go home. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, I was giving a talk at the University of North Carolina. Someone here is from North Carolina. Which one of you is from North Carolina? It's in the profiles. It's in the profiles. You're from North Carolina. California. Close. I I spent some time in Tennessee. North California. I've misread it. Thank you. I've misread it. I was in North Carolina. And... um, I was giving a talk at the University of Green... University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And um, this talk was financed, arranged, by the um, Biology Department and the Department of Women's Studies. Because they thought, because this was Goethe, Perty... Anyway, the chap who did it, he wanted to get into Goethean work and he was a research biologist he'd been there for some time and he very much wanted to get into Goethean work um, he was talking to me about this and how could you do this and what's this like and that like and so on and that and we're walking down this long corridor to where I'm going to give this talk and the corridor is plastered with pictures of this kind of thing and uh, he said you know something or other about he says something I was trying to explain to him about Goethe and I saw that and I said to him what's that? oh he said you don't want to know about that he said this is the kind of research I want to get away from I want to get into Goethe research you don't want to know about that so I said well what is it? so and eventually he reluctant to tell me I said well that's Goethe there right in front of your eyes and he was horrified he didn't want to know because he wanted Goethe to do something completely different. He didn't want to know 
that that was already there in the work that he was involved with. It's very interesting. He really, he really didn't want to know. And so I said to him, could you get me a copy of that? And he was a funny bloke. Um, he said, well, I'll have to get permission from the head of the university. I said, oh, come on. I'm not going to tell anybody. I just want a photocopy of the thing. And I just, you know, he said, well, I'll have to think about that. At least I ought to talk to the head of the department, but I ought to go to the vice chancellor or whatever it was, because this is university property. <laughs> anyway, I did eventually get him to give me one. And he said, you'll never show it to anyone, will you? And I said, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> he's mad, actually, absolutely mad. But he was disappointed when I said that there was Goethe on the wall in front of him, and he was already doing this, but he could learn to look at this another way. A very strange attitude. Anyway, that's where that comes from. Right, that's that. Now, something important comes up. Not that not, not the rest of it's been unimportant. I want to talk, I'm, I'm just taking this further over time, going further and further into it. Um, uh, because we have to, it's that, it's, well, actually, well, I'm actually working in the same way as phenomenology, trying to see ever more clearly what it is to get the optimal view. It's, uh, that's how you do things. When Husserl describes all this, he's not just the saying, well, this is phenomenology, he's saying this is what we actually do. Uh, but there's a way of seeing this. It's not that you decided that way of putting it was wrong, this way is better. No, all ways are ways in which it manifests. But you're looking for the optimal way. So that's why I'm working this way. Those who are getting tired, by the way, do feel free to go to sleep. It won't bother me. But it's, um, it's a bit hot in here, and it's, we've got three quarters of an hour to go. Can we stand up and have a stretch? Yeah, go on. It's a bit, uh, bit airless, isn't it? Thank you. Tomorrow's the last day, and um, there'll be a hundred thousand questions that must be allowed for. But actually, what usually happens is people have hordes and hordes of questions. When it gets to it, they find they haven't got any, because actually the, we've gone through it all and things have been changed. Because the questions people feel that they must ask come from their previous way of seeing things, yeah. and then when we've gone through it, they don't have those questions anymore. It's getting easier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you can only do it by going through the process. You can't. You can't. Questions are okay, but there are questions and questions. There are many different kinds of questions, and the, the kind of question which takes us right out of what we're doing to something else, or another kind of question takes us ahead of where we are to where we will be. But actually, if you go there prematurely and I answer it by I answer it, you won't be able to understand the answer and that will lead to another question. Yes. Whereas if in fact we go through the process, at the end the question will disappear. Yeah. Um, so well, people often say that I don't want questions or this, that and the other. It isn't actually true. It's just that I see the process. I actually see what's going on. Uh, it sounds crazy, I know, but I do. I can see what's happening and I see where we are and I see where people's questions come from. And sometimes that's a question which is actually really, you know, Yogi will answer that. But very often it, it comes out of the process itself and it won't even exist when we get somewhere else. But of course you can't say that to someone because it makes it look as if you're belittling their question. And you must never do that. Goodness me. Right. I want to talk about this <coughs> notion of becoming other 
in order to remain itself. Now, this is a phrase which Ron Brady used. Ron Brady was a philosopher who contributed much towards understanding Goethe's morphology. And I met him a couple of times. Sadly, he died suddenly. And I uh, uh, said that was a great loss. Um, now, there is a book edited by Arthur David Seaman and Arthur Zions. That's Zajonk, for those who don't know. Um, and it's called Goethe's Way of Science, isn't it? And there is a subtitle which has the word phenomenological in it. I think it might be a phenomenological approach to nature or the phenomenology of nature or something. <coughs> um, there are several essays in that book which would be of great interest to you. Um, essays by Craig, essay by Craig, Holridge, a very good essay on Shad's work. Um, and there is in there <coughs> an essay by Brady, which is, I think, called some Goethe's, oh, I don't know what, Goethe's something revisited, isn't it? I can't remember. Anyway, it's Brady. See, it's totally getting old. I mean, I used to know all these titles and everything. And all I had to do was think of it, and the book appeared in my mind with the title, subtitle, and anything. And I also never made references, because all I had to do in my mind was, I know, oh, that book's because of so-and-so. I could open the book in my mind and see the page. So I never made references. Now I don't know where the hell I am, because that faculty is gone. And I just, uh, I'm struggling around trying to find where things are in books. And then even when I found them, I find five minutes later I've forgotten where it was. That's why I say you should get someone younger for this. Uh, because um, there's going to come a time when I'm going to sit here and say, what is it I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, there is in that book an article, this article by Brady which approaches this all phenomenologically and it's absolutely terrific. You should read that. That the quotes I'm giving here are not from that article. That article I've just referred to is a revisit of the article I'm quoting from. So why don't I recommend that? It's because it was in a book which I have a copy of, which is published by. Uh, oh God, well I can't remember now. But anyway, um, and then the publishers decided it was in a, a, a series. It was very good. Uh, they they decided that they would not republish really it again, so it's, up, it's unavailable. Um, Brian was very turned on by it. So, but the original, the, the, the second version, or his revisit of it, is available in this book, which is here, isn't it? So you need to put that on the list. In brackets, you could put Brady's article, if I can remember what it was. So this is Ron Brady, who describes the intrinsically dynamic form of life as becoming other in order to remain itself. Well, I've got self-differencing there, haven't we? Here's a quote. He says, The forms of life are not finished work, but always forms becoming, and their potency to be otherwise very important phrase, their potency to be otherwise is an immediate aspect of their internal constitution. The becoming that belongs to this constitution is not a process that finishes when it reaches a certain goal, but a condition of existence. <coughs> a necessity <coughs> a necessity to change in order to remain the same. It's fabulous how much there is in that. 
uh, really is. This is a very clear recognition of the self-differencing organ ever changing into other modes of itself. So with that organ, what we see as the diversity of organs is the living unity of the plant. It's quite astonishing. It's extraordinary. The diversity is the unity. Here we have unity in the form of diversity. How astonishing. The diversity is the unity. Whereas the previous approach was get rid of the diversity to find the unity. Organically we have found the diversity is the unity when we can learn to see it. That's astonishing. Amazing. And it's fascinating really. Darwin also was very aware of this kind of thing. Um, and I, his work on barnacles was, was wonderful. And his work on barnacles is absolutely key for everything Darwin did. I mean, there are so many stories about Darwin which are just simply nonsense. Um, one of them was that he had his theory of evolution, <coughs> his, his theory of evolution. He knew perfectly well it was an alternative to the German theory at the time, which is embryological, but the rest didn't seem to realize that. He had it in 1842 and stuck it in a drawer. Well, it's not true, because what he put in a drawer was quite different from what he finally published. And what really got him was the later work he did on barnacles. When he found, that's when he discovered that variation, as he put it, was ubiquitous. Variation was everywhere. He had actually thought that variation only happened under certain circumstances and was quite restricted. When he did his work on barnacles, they wouldn't stay still. They were continually changing in form. And so he, he said to Hooker, variation of variety is ubiquitous. And he said, I don't know how I'm going to pin this down. It's almost as if there aren't any species. And he then began to see that what you see as variation will, have, will eventually possibly turn into new species. Um, it was terribly important work. And in a way, he saw the same thing as Goethe saw it, but he, at the end he interpreted it in a different way. But and this, is, this is reflected in this here. Right, so far, <coughs> what we've done is we've considered the organs of the plant. But we can now expand our horizons a bit to just consider the dynamics of becoming other in order to remain itself in the variety of different plants of a species. Because if you take a plant, a particular type of plant, then uh, the form which it will actually grow into will vary depending on the conditions in which it is planted. It will depend on the soil, it will depend on the climate, it will depend on the temperature, it will depend on the rainfall, uh, it will depend on the height <coughs> this of the, uh, the land. All, all these differences will result in the same plant taking different forms. <coughs> Sometimes differences can be quite striking. Now Goethe became very aware of this when he moved to Italy across the Alps into, in, from southern Germany into Italy, crossing the Alps, he suddenly realised that these plants he was seeing, which uh, were, were actually the same as the plants he was familiar with, but taking quite different form. And in this particular case, you're actually seeing uh, this thing of becoming other in order to remain itself in different circumstances. The key thing is he wasn't seeing different plants we're seeing different manifestations of the same plants, of the same plant. It's really one plant coming into being differently according to the circumstances in which it finds itself. Now, <coughs> in this case, <coughs> again, <coughs> this, here we have one plant being itself multiply. So the one is not separate from the many. The many are the one in this way of thinking. What we find is another quote from Deleuze, which I like. Multiplicity is the inseparable... <coughs> Multiplicity is the inseparable manifestation, essential transformation, and constant symptom of unity. Multiplicity is the... <coughs> Multiplicity is the affirmation of unity. Becoming is the affirmation of being. It's terrific, isn't it? It's a French philosopher. Probably late 1960s. 
So this is what how Goethe um, how, how Goethe saw this. And we, now we've got to be very careful because it's very easy at this point to fall into an, an inorganic mechanical way of thinking. Um, we, uh, we're probably already thinking that way now without realising it. Um, because we can easily lose sight of the quality of livingness which is the organism's own potency to be otherwise. There's a key phrase here. There's potency to be otherwise. So it, it can change in order to remain the same as it were. There's potency to be otherwise and we can think of the organism as responding to changed circumstances in a mechanical manner as if it were like a system in physics. So we imagine the plant in the different environments and the environment having an effect on that plant and the plant being simply passive, inert as it were. So that the form which the plant takes is simply the result of the external conditions acting on the plant. Now that is not true. What happens is <coughs> that the conditions which the plant finds itself in influence the form which the plant takes, but they do not cause it. It's not mechanical. What happens is, as Goethe put it, the plant responds to the challenge of the environment out of its own possibilities. The plant responds uh, in its own way out of its own potency to be otherwise. So the response is actually the active creation of the plant, not a passive modification produced by the environment. And he talked about the thing as a conversation between the living organism and its environment. Which draws out, of course, uh, draws our attention to the plant's active contribution to the form which it takes. Um, Steiner stated this very clearly. Um, Steiner wrote three books on uh, Goethe, which are very good, um, before, before he developed other things, because he started out as a kind of uh, very much involved with editing Goethe's scientific work. But he was the first person to edit the complete edition of Goethe's scientific work. And uh, the, the books, the three books are one, which they keep changing the title of, The Theory of Knowledge Implicit in Goethe's World Conception, a book which I like very much. Another book called Goethe's World View, which is good. And then there's a collection of essays called Goethe as a Scientist, or Goethe the Scientist, which has now been totally uh, retranslated by John Barnes. And I haven't seen the new edition, because I'm not working in that area now, it's a bit expensive. But the thing is, um, uh, and, uh, everyone says it's good, and I know John will, I know John very well, will have done a very good job. And it's called Nature's Open Secret. But it's, it's uh, the, the original one, the 1950s collection of essays, uh, Goethe, Goethe the Scientist, was dreadful, the translation. Because <coughs> they were so, it was all done by Germans, and they were so slavish to Steiner. I remember being told you it must not alter one word Steiner said and they kept the same word order so they translated from German into English but kept the German word order to keep Steiner's word order it was bloody mad second swearing but there you are <coughs> um, uh, and I worked with these books which are badly translated but I mean I, I found a great, great deal from them um, and now I think there's this new version called Nature's Open Secret and even if I hadn't read that it's very good, I, I would imagine that John Barnes has done it, that it will be excellent. Um, and then Goethe's worldview I liked very much. Theory of knowledge implicit in Goethe's world conception is not for everyone. It's a very short book, and it's the first book Stein ever wrote when he was only 25. He's very much concerned there with his argument with Kant. But he does go into the Goethe, and it is, I, I thought it was a terrific book. But it's not necessarily for everyone. It's actually, um, yeah. Anyway, those are the three works that, uh, that, that Steiner wrote, which I have drawn upon in the past. 
And so this is a quote from Steiner. Uh, we must conceive at a deeper level than the influences of external conditions, something which does not passively allow itself to be determined by these conditions, but actively determines itself under their influence. So it doesn't passively allow itself to be determined by the conditions. It actively determines itself under their influence. So it's a response. It's a challenge and response. It's not a mechanical conditioning of the plant. It's not like physics. It's the, the environment is a challenge to the plant and it responds out of its own, out of its own resources actively out of its own potency to be otherwise and a, a new plant form therefore emerges. So the external conditions stimulate the plant to develop into a new form but they do not determine that new form. Can you get the idea? This is, this is what it's like when we try to think organically. If we don't do this, we fall into this kind of passive other approach. We, we treat the whole thing as if it was something mechanical. So you don't see that the, spot, the plant responds actively out of its own potency to be otherwise to produce the form of itself which the environment evokes. So, you know, that double thing I did yesterday, you could actually just see, you could... You, you, you could actually do that for this. Yeah. Yeah, you could just do it for this. It's a brain flip. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Now, here's a quote from Craig Holridge from his very good book. But it's got different titles in America and England, so I can't be blamed for not knowing that. Um, I, I, knew the, I knew the American title. I can't even remember that now. God. And I, God, I was, don't let Craig though, I didn't remember the title of the book. Uh, what's it called? Do you think it, genetics, oh, forgotten fact, what's it called? You can't remember, can you? No, I don't know. Oh, well, there we are. <laughs> Craig's book's here, though, isn't it? Um, no, I'll have a look at it and put it on the list. Got to be. God, I guess things have got really bad for me. I'm not usually as bad as this. It's because of your cough. It could be. Yeah. They could. Anyway, Craig's book on genetics, the first two chapters are really very good. It's a very good book. Do you think it's a good book? I've read bits of it, I've read the whole thing. Right. Anyway, this is taken from the beginning of that book. <coughs> Imagine that you are holding a groundsel seed in your hands before planting it. Depending on how, when, and where you plant the seed, a limitless variety of forms can arise. All these potential forms are not, of course, stored in the seed. The concrete forms are emergent characteristics that arise out of a germinal state and develop in the interplay between the plant's plasticity and the environmental conditions. In particular surroundings, the potential of the plant is evoked. But what appears is only one manifestation of the myriad ways in which this plant could develop. That's the organic approach. So here again. <coughs> oh, <God. coughs> the specific form which an individual plant takes is neither determined by the environment nor is it predetermined by the organism. As he says, Holdridge says, we must avoid the trap of thinking in a finished product manner as if the <coughs> as if the potential forms <coughs> were already there in the organism like peas in a pod waiting to come out when the circumstances are right. They're not. That of course is finished product thinking. That's trying to get to the milk by way of the cheese. Here are these finished forms. Let's now imagine that they were there in advance already inside. And what usually happens is we switch from one to the other. <coughs> <coughs> we either <coughs> treat the plant mechanically as if it were a physical object simply being uh, determined by external circumstances <coughs> or we give the plant <coughs> something of its own but we give it something its own 
in entirely the wrong way, in an organic way, by sticking all the various forms it might turn into, imagining them being there already in the plant. <coughs> as well as the variety resulting from environmental factors, there's the much greater variety which arises from the genetic variation that can take place in a species. And that's what interests the breeder. He or she is always on the lookout for interesting variations. Now you remember, these variations happen spontaneously. And nobody produces them necessarily. They simply find them there and so on under various circumstances. And then you can, having spotted one, if you want, want that one, you can then sort of uh, develop it. Yeah. And it's the process of artificial selection, yeah. which Darwin, of course, took as the basis for his view of natural selection. And this is how the huge variety in any one species of plants arises. For example, there are a thousand different varieties of peony, the peony plant. Now I know this because uh, my wife is watching the Chelsea Flower Show, which happens once a year in England, on the television. Now you can't go to the Chelsea Flower Show because you can't get a ticket unless you're a very special person. And since neither of us is a very special person, we can't go. Um, but she watches it on television. And I, of course, pretend not to be interested. <laughs> and I, this time, was busy pretending not to be interested. <laughs> I heard them say, this is peony day today. The whole place is full of peonies. How the managers, I don't know. And then this person has been interviewed and he said, there are a thousand different varieties of peony. What, I said? Isn't that interesting? A thousand different varieties of peony. Amazing. So there you have them, and they're all there. Uh, 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 all there for you to see on peony day. And you go, and you see them, and you see all these many different plants, which is actually a giant multiplicity in unity of one plant. Because this uh, diversity, which you see... <coughs> is in fact one plant being itself differently. It's an expression of the dynamic unity of self-differencing there in front of your eyes. Of course, you usually just see many different plants. But if you can shift the thinking upstream, then you can recognize that the diversity of peonies we see is the living unity of the peony. It's there in front of your eyes where you wouldn't expect to see it. Who would expect to see unity hidden in front of us as diversity? <laughs> it's astonishing. But that's it. Mm. That's where the unity is. Right in front of us, hidden as the diversity. The last place we'd look for it. Because we know if you want unity, you must get rid of diversity and find that which is the very same. It's marvellous, isn't it? Now, all of this is there in Goethe's way of thinking. And that is, uh, obviously, if what is living is always becoming other in order to remain itself, then clearly, diversity is unity. For that very thing, it's becoming other in order to remain itself. Self-differencing. So diversity must be the unity. Absolutely astonishing. Mind-blowing. Um, much better than the Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> and there, just, this is the kind of consequence. What I've done is I've tried to draw out over the years from Goethe's work on metamorphosis those few remarks that he makes at the beginning. This whole way of seeing and the new idea of the one and the many which is implicit in this. And this is what you come to. That the diversity you see actually is the unity. And um, yes. Um, does Goethe extend that idea um, of all the plants are uh, the same plant, but for their circumstances to all life? Well, uh, he extends it to uh, he extends it to, to all plants. Okay, but doesn't go. 
Well, you see, there's, a, there's always a problem here, which I've hinted at already. People always do want to do this. But the question is going to be how you're going to do this. It's hard enough for just doing it with the plants. Uh, with one plant, it's hard enough doing it. <coughs> now, <coughs> of course, there are people who are very interested in the possibility of developing it further. Goethe extends it to the whole plant kingdom to see the whole plant kingdom as one plant. But even that is problematic, but it might say something about that later. Um, the real problem is going to be in doing this, one, you could make an extrapolation which is unwarranted. It's, it's a very, <coughs> see, the intellectual mind always wants to shoot to infinity. Yeah. It always does. But Goethe himself didn't do that because he was actually rooted in the concrete. That I will talk about tomorrow. Uh, for him it was not attractive to shoot to infinity, as it's not attractive to me. Because I can see how the mind does that. And also I'm a good student of Kant. Um, <coughs> there you are. Because uh, Kant actually shows in the Critique of Pure Reason how there is a tendency for the mind to think outside of what it is capable of doing. That, and when it does that, it comes up with all sorts of things. And he shows how, in the antinomies of pure reason, he shows how it, it, is, it is equally easy to prove that the universe had a beginning as it is to prove that the universe had no beginning. And they're there. You should, you should study this. People who want to... Well, it's because you should study this in Kant. It's very good. The, the antinomies of reason. For him, the, when he discovered this, it was a great discovery. And he shows, and there's a proof of one and a proof of the other. He says, well, or, or you can disprove one and disprove the other, whichever way around you want to go. And so here you've got two opposite things that can't both be true, uh, but there, there they are, you see. And he says, well, this is what happens with the mind. The mind is very suited to what it deals with, but it's suited for dealing with more concrete realities, and put it in other terms. So when it actually goes on holiday, as it were, that's Wittgenstein's phrase, and it goes off outside of the, of, of the realm in which it is at home, then it produces all these problems. And that's his critique of pure reason. Because he says now reason has become pure. It's divorced itself from the concrete cases. And the title of the book, Critique of Pure Reason, is his, that's the very kind of thing he's critiquing. And so what happens when we want to run off to infinity or, let, or can we take this down, wow, let's extrapolate to there, is it might be possible. On the other hand, it might not be for other good reasons. This is just the mind wanting to do that because there's that tendency in the mind to want to do that kind of thing. Uh, that doesn't mean the mind is right. And you say, well, you should keep it in check. But, of course, the other thing is, well, there might be something in that. But my goodness me, you're going to have to know an intolerable amount of biology before you could actually begin to do that. Otherwise, you're going to produce a sort of Mickey Mouse picture. And that, of course, is what many of the Germans did after Goethe, because they did want to do this, and they produced a lot of, uh, of likely just-so stories. It was like fairy stories, passed off as science. Until, in the end, the Germans got fed up with this, and they... This is called Natur philosophy, and they chucked the whole thing out of the universities, and they went over to empirical mathematical research, as was done in France and England. And then that was 1840. And then the Germans excelled at that. And by 1870, they're having to persuade the British government to start institutes for physics because the Germans were going so far ahead, and they they unified, and they started out by them being. You know, they were obviously going into military research and so on and that. And that's how the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge and the Clarendon Laboratory at Oxford came into being. They never would have done if it hadn't been the fact the Germans had these giant physics institutes in which they were producing this stuff. And they were doing that after 40 years after they turned over from this sort of stuff to empirical mathematical research. It took them 30 to 40 years to reach that level. That's all. That's astonishing. It really is. Um, but they chucked out all this kind of thing 
because it was all based on well you could you could make it up and of course they didn't realize well you know this is and then you can say oh this is spiritual and that's spiritual oh, isn't it lovely and you know eventually people get fed up and say well actually this is just is what's the flaky is the word we use now isn't it flaky and and so the it would be premature but there, I mean, there are people who think that this can be done, and it may well be possible to be done. But you'd have to know an awful lot, wouldn't you? But can you just do it with, um, like, genetics and tracing and evolution, and show how the if every if all life evolved from the same thing, wouldn't wouldn't that show? I don't know. It might do. It wouldn't satisfy the. It wouldn't satisfy various people who are going through my mind at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> But see, stem cell research does this. Now, uh, I think that's true, but again, some people will say, oh, you shouldn't talk about stem cell research, that's nasty. But this is the, this is the Gertian people could be very peculiar, um, and they shouldn't be. Um, see, that's why I'm not interested in them. It's not, it's not my cup of tea, isn't that kind of thing. See, stem cell research, I think, does it. So, yes, you could probably, perhaps, perhaps you could read it from there. Perhaps I have exaggerated. Perhaps I have exaggerated. What do you think, Stefan? Have I exaggerated? I think you might have a little bit. Okay. Because you could, for example, take a fossil lineage, right. so fishes, yeah. where you've got clear stages from early fishes through to amphibia. Yeah. And that's that's there in the fossil record. Yeah, with gaps, but it's you can you can sort of go into the flow right. of how uh, an amphibian fish turn into amphibian and then it into reptile. You can fill in the gaps a bit like with the leaf sequence. Yes. Okay. So you can do it, and then you there's stuff before fishes as well. I mean, you've got all the way back to the Cambrian explosion. Cambrian explosion. And then you've got the bacteria. So mm. you could you could build up a visualization of it, um, like a leaf sequence. Is that the kind of thing which? I mean, that interests you, doesn't it? Yeah. It, it Only your animators and... Yeah, that's right. And, yeah. Yeah, although um, I'm not sure that's what you'd be after, but I think you, if you wanted to have the equivalent of a leaf sequence... Yes, OK. You could do, you could do that. Right. Um, I'm not sure where that leads you to. Does that lead you to, to a sort of Proteus? Well, I mean, there is... Problem. I mean, I know of one book. <laughs> I know one book. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> Can I ask you? Hang on, I've got to think now. I, I've, I've read this book twice, but I can't remember the title. It's in the same series in America that my book's published in. I know that much. And, um, see, all these books ought to be there when I look at the shelf. I <laughs> Sorry, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, it's called... Oh, I don't know what it's called. I can't remember the title of the other But he does this with the vertebrates. Right. Uh, not, not Shad. No, it's not Shad. Right. It's the other chap. <clears throat> it, it, actually, it's a, the chap who Shad doesn't like, apparently. Yes. No, no I, I was telling us that they're at loggerheads, these two, Shad and this chap. So it's the, it's the, the, the person who's not Shad. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, the, maybe the focus of the two ways of is just um, becoming other to remain oneself. That is the Proteus of life. Yeah, well, I mean, I would, I would be happy with that. Yes, I think. Uh, you see, I think the problem is here. I'm interested in the philosophy of this. <coughs> well, I haven't forgotten you. What I'm interested in is the, the idea of the one and the many that comes from this. Because I'm interested in that in the cultural historical context. Because I take this and I use this with regard to hermeneutics. And the question of how can there be different interpretations of a work? Are they just completely different? Or are, are some of them wrong? Or one of them? Can we find an average interpretation? Or is it more like this? And I've done this work on what I call the philosophy of unfinished meaning, which I could call organic hermeneutics, but it would actually mislead people, I think, <coughs> which I've tried to show how <coughs> the different interpretations of a work uh, can be understood in terms of th this kind of approach. Uh, that's what I'm interested in. Um, now, because I'm working with biological material, 
<coughs> Once I've got the idea that I'm after from it, personally I'm no longer interested in the biological aspect of it, because I don't know any biology. That's the problem. So that's why in answering your question and that I, I, I can make a bit of a fool of myself. I'm like people talking about physics that don't actually know any physics. I don't actually know any biology. When I was at school, you had to choose between physics and biology, and I, I chose physics, not knowing why. Um, I think I got muddled up. I think my dad said, do biology, but I got it wrong. I, I, think, I, think, I think he meant me to do biology and I did physics. I, think I got it wrong. Anyway, there we are. So, I, you, you, you never did biology, so I never did any biology ever. And the only thing I know is what I've picked up. And it, because my wife's a biologist, so that's been very helpful. But I don't know any, so I have no background, and I don't, I don't really know what I'm talking about. This is now evident. Um, so you're a biologist? Uh, I've studied some biology. So there you are, you see. You know that, you, but that's good. I, so I'm, I was a bit limited there in what I said. I shall therefore take it back. Stem cells. Yes? Um, it's not it. Um, for about the last, well, for quite a while this morning, I've been distracted and thinking about, I, I think I get quite a lot of what you're saying, but I started thinking about dualism, that virtually everything you said has been extensive, intensive, same difference. And then I started thinking about my undergraduate studies and um, Levi Strauss and the structuralism of the mind and all that. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could um, say if there's any uh, uh, affinity or, <coughs> or <coughs> it's sort of completely different. Because the, the way of thinking, we were talking about unity, but each unity there is a, a dualism contained within which would then transcend. And as I remember it, sort of structuralism was about left and right and this and that, and it was applied to Amazonian Indian um, societies. But it, it was also supposed to be um, uh, transcending that at, at some point. Not everything is just left, right, you know, black, white. So I don't know, because th that was very big in the 70s, and um, it, it must have, it was around as many of these other things were around. Well, so far as I'm concerned, structuralism doesn't really have any connection with this. But you could possibly make one, because Structuralism is based on binary oppositions and um, that actually came out of the linguistics because mm. the real model for structuralism was Ferdinand de Saussure's course on general linguistics at the University of Geneva just before the First World War. The course was published, a student's notes were published and the course became famous. This influenced Levi Strauss and Roland Barthes and others. Um, but the idea, one of the things that did, did come out of that, which went into later French philosophy in Derrida and others, was the importance of difference, difference as being fundamental. Um, my own approach to it is not the same as that. In this particular case, I'm looking at it in terms of Goethe's organic approach. And this brings me to this idea of self-differencing, which I find very helpful in a number of areas when you combine it with the phenomenology. So my interest is, for example, what I mentioned, this question of the uh, understanding of, of, a, of a written work, as I say, a work of philosophy, that different people at different times will understand that work differently. And there are many ways in which that can be explained away. But what I, what, I, what I have found is that when people approach this, they think of it in terms of finished meaning. So they think that the meaning is there 
as it were, locked up in the text or wherever, and it's what the author had in mind, and so somehow or other you've got to find out what that meaning is. And therefore there should be one meaning only, and if you can't find that meaning, then in fact the only other thing that can happen <coughs> is that different people will have different understandings, but these are like many different understandings, and there's no way of saying which, if any of them, corresponds to what the author had in mind. But I, my point is that that's how it must inevitably appear if you begin with the notion that the meaning is finished. It was there in the author's mind, somehow they're locked up in that text. You're dealing with finished meaning, and understanding can therefore only be reproduction in your mind of what was originally in the author's mind. Now, if you uh, don't do that, and you say, well, this is a downstream approach, because if we now go upstream, we can actually come to meaning, not in the sense of a meaning, but meaning, and say that actually the meaning of this text is something that can come to life and mean now. And uh, so it's a living encounter, it's a living meaning. And when it means now, it, if we're thinking, for example, of a particular work of Aristotle's, then it means now in a form which actually takes on a form which is for these conditions that are here now, not the conditions as they were at the time of the original author way back. So you're not doing a kind of historical research. You're not trying to go back into the past, a telescope into the past. You're not waiting for a survival of the past to come floating down through time to you. What's actually happening is that the meaning of the work is coming to life and meaning now. And I call this unfinished meaning because the meaning is ever unfinished as life is ever unfinished. And it's continually, as it were, um, comes to life, but it comes to life differently. And this thing about um, becoming other in order to remain itself and potency to be otherwise, all those phrases, I can find them there in hermeneutics. And so the work itself becomes like a living <coughs> organism and it grows through time and it grows through all the readings and interpretations that it has. And therefore any particular work is now like the, the king of a potato, much, much more itself now than ever it was when it began. And, that's, and therefore when we work on the things in this kind of way, we are actually contributing to the life of that work. And there is no question then about this problem, which bedevils everyone, of objectivism and relativism, because it's not a question saying what is the one objectively right meaning, on the other, it's not saying, oh, well, it's all relative then, isn't it? Because actually, each meaning that emerges is the meaning of the work, but differently, it is evoked differently according to those circumstances. <coughs> and that conversation there, you have a conversation between the, the work and the circumstances in which it's been interpreted, the reader. And so out of that conversation, the work takes on a new form, which is a possible form for that work to take but it's not stored up in the work already in advance it's organic, it's dynamic this is why the dynamics of being is the key idea here this is exactly what has been described but I've just described now, that's the dynamics of, of the work being now and I find this this is what I've been working on I've been trying to actually <coughs> describe the hermeneutics so it comes together with this idea of the one and the many here, the dynamic unity of self-differencing. And you come to the point where, there, you, you know, this diversity, uh, period, the, 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 diver, the, the diversity is the unity. Well, you get the same kind of thing, therefore, in hermeneutics, but then people throw up their hands with horror. And they say, oh, heavens above, we can't find out what is the true meaning of the word. That's like someone saying, oh, good heavens, look at all these peonies. Which one is the true peony? Well, they're all true peonies. And then, you know, and I've met lots of little jokes about, 
oh goodness me, would, would the gardener throw up hands in horror and say, good heavens, this is the postmodern peony. How can they, you know, how can they all be true? This is postmodernism. These peonies are all only relative peonies. Where's the true peony? And so on and that. And, oh good Lord, there's nihilism at the heart of the peony and so on. That. Well, he wouldn't say that because the gardener would rejoice at this diversity, which is the unity of life. So we should rejoice in this sense of the diversity of interpretations which is the dynamic unity of the work coming into being, always coming into being. The, ph the philosophy of unfinished meaning. Unfinished doesn't mean, oh heck, he only got so far and then he got tired and he missed the end off. The unfinished meaning is that meaning is never finished because it's always coming into being afresh and newly in different situations. But it is that meaning. And that's, that's, uh, that's this, this is what turns me on. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to, trying to do and make clear and so on and that, but it's not easy. Okay. So in that sense, there's a relation, but I don't approach it in terms of structuralism, because I find the, the, yes. the binary oppositions and differences mm. in structuralism limited. Yes, I mean, I, I realise that, yeah. but uh, yeah. I think there would be a danger that you get sort of caught up in that. And, yeah. and as I understand it, I'm sort of a bit hazy, it's a long time ago, yeah. and it sort of passed me by at 18. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we were all, at that time, we were all, you know... But well, looking for the deep structures of the mind, but the, yeah. the deep structure of the mind that everybody would have the same deep structure. Yeah, well, that's Chomsky, isn't it, with the language? So, yes. Yeah, um, yeah. and uh, insists, he still insists that that's yeah. true. Yeah. He still to this day insists that that's true, in spite of the evidence that he's there's not. A, yeah, well, I was going to say, there's evidence now that Chomsky was wrong. Yeah, there is. <laughs> there is one person who doesn't believe that. It's like Tony Blair. I mean, uh, Chomsky's the Tony Blair of linguistics. <laughs> I can go home now. I think I've finished. I'm not bothering to come tomorrow. You have to. Oh, I've got We're to. Not letting you go. Yeah, but, uh, there's a bit I want to finish off, which will actually lead into Margaret. Um, but don't tell her that because if I get it wrong, she, she, <laughs> but and then we can have just questions, discussion, and everything. Uh, and meanwhile, it's five past one. We've done well. Thank you. We've got to the end. Thank you. <laughs>